but we're here to hear from Dr. Kira Masith about international ties, disaster behavioral health with a global lens. We always start our events with a lab labor and land acknowledgement. And I know this is a virtual space and want to make sure that you understand we are doing these acknowledgements because we in region 10 actually have 272 federally recognized tribes and many that are not federally recognized. And so we always want to acknowledge where the University of Washington and our center, though we are virtual with you today, um, you know, acknowledge that these are unceded lands and that we want to acknowledge and pay respect and work for justice in these communities. And then also have been speaking more recently about the unaddressed legacy of stolen labor and slavery and that exploitation of workers, you know, continues today and there's legacy there. So we just want to acknowledge that there is a lot of foundation on um, how the University of Washington and much of our society was created. So if you are interested in learning more about the stewards of your land, you can click on the link in the chat. Um, I'm Christina Clayton. I'm one of the co-directors of the Northwest MHTTC, and we're happy to be with you today. Um, these are serious topics, and I'm always heartened that Kira is here to share perspective about her work um, around these very, very tragic situations and scenarios. So um, it's with a heavy heart, you know, that we we start off today. Um, but please know um, this will be recorded. If people couldn't make it, um, you'll have access to the slides and, and some other things you'll, you'll see in the chat. A little bit about our network. We're a nationwide network that is supported by SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And so there are 10 regional centers um, and a network coordinating office and a couple of other centers that have actually changed into centers of excellence for American Indian, Alaska Native and Hispanic and Latino. Um, so we'll update this slide now that that just changed this month. Um, but we are over um, and, and beho beholden to uh, Region 10, which is Alaska, Idaho, uh, Oregon and Washington. And we're cited at the University of Washington in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So we each have areas of uh, focus for the network and ours is evidence-based practices for psychosis. But as you can see, we obviously talk about a lot of different topics in our webinars. We have learning communities for people in region 10. There are a plethora of online courses that we and the network have created that are all free. So our, our whole goal is to offer free training and TA for the workforce. And we do that in a variety of ways. So um, Kira was kind enough to record another podcast with me earlier today. So we do have a podcast and um, have a big resource library and other things to help support your training and learning. And it's very helpful for me. It really keeps me um, feeling in the know about what you all are, are learning and what presenters are sharing. Just a little slide here that we do a poll that there are a lot of different perspectives in our work and that we just always want to have, you know, a person first perspective and non-judgmental avoiding assumptions. This is just something our network came up with. And uh, so we share that here. And some logistics about the event, uh, you're muted, you're off camera, it's a webinar, um, but there is closed captioning available, you'll get the videos and slides, um, there is a certificate available of attendance, not formal CEUs. Um, but uh, for today, uh, if you have questions, comments that you want to share in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Um, tech issues, just a reaction, something like that. But Dr. Maseth will be taking questions near the end. And so if you can put your questions in the Q&A box or button, whatever you call that, uh, we can't move it from the chat for you. I don't know why, um, but if you can put it in there, I'll be curating those as we speak and make sure we have enough time um, at the end for that. So we'll get to as many questions as we can. 
just uh, another thing. We are funded by SAMHSA, but they obviously don't have um, opinions about our specific content today. And we do ask if you could please, what helps us keep providing free training is if you could do a quick two minute survey at the end of this webinar, we'll give the link a couple of times and you'll get a Zoom uh, email, I think as well tomorrow. Um, it just really helps us in aggregate ways know if you enjoyed the content, if you'd like to see something different or how, how you felt about that. So um, appreciate your feedback. If you aren't getting our newsletter or event notices directly, we'll put some links in the chat for how you can get that because we want to share that with as many people as would like it. So um, certainly ways you can connect with us. And then Dr. Mosseth is doing another webinar near the end of this month around healthy teams and dynamics and tactics for successful working groups. So she's a gem. You'll learn today if you haven't seen her before. So um, yeah, we'll hope to see you then as well. And now to the good stuff. Um, today's presenter, Dr. Karen Mosseth, is a practicing clinical psychologist who sees patients at Snohomish Psychology Associates in Everett and Edmonds, and is a teaching professor at Seattle University, and formerly served as a co-lead for the Behavioral Health Strike Team at the Washington State Department of Health throughout the COVID response. That's actually when we first met her, is doing some support um, in response to the COVID pandemic. She also owns Astrum Health LLC and consults with organizations and educational groups about disaster preparedness and resilience building within local communities. Dr. Maseth has provided training to community groups and professionals, both regionally and abroad, as a co-developer of the Health Support Team Program. And her work and research focus on disaster behavioral health, resilience, and recovery from trauma, as well as small and large scale critical incidents response and preparation for organizations. She has worked abroad extensively with disaster survivors and refugees from Haiti, Jordan, and Poland, and has trained first responders and healthcare workers throughout Puget Sound and the United States, and currently serves in the adult mental health clinical seat on Washington State's Disaster Medical Advisory Committee. Dr. Masif, Kira, thank you so much for being here today. That is such a nice introduction, Christina. Thank you very much. I feel like, oh, who who are we waiting for here? It's not. I can't. know. I know. <laughs> well, and and I know you'll be acknowledging some of the tragedies that are happening lately, but I just want to say um, to our listeners and our uh, you know participants today that you are so helpful and you've been helpful for over three years, at least personally and professionally, for me in how we can not make sense of all these terrible things that happen, but how you have learned over the years to support and give hope to these tragedies and terrible things that are happening all the time. Um, and you always provide such insight into how we can cope or what might be happening for us. So I just, you know, again, very excited to have you here today. I wish we could talk about something different. Um, obviously, I'm sure we all do, but um, thank you so much for, for making the time today. Yeah, it's my pleasure for sure. Um, kind of on that note, uh, I, I don't want to just jump into this topic in general without um, a little bit of reflection on all of our parts and some acknowledgement of, um, you know, three of the most recent horrible, horrific sort of things that have been happening. Um, one was the big flood in Libya that killed upwards of 40 to 50,000 people, maybe more. Um, additionally, the, the horrific violence that is unfolding in Israel and in Gaza um, is it's shocking and it's very, very difficult to um, you sort of, you know, when immerse in the news about all of these things and feel like, you know, what can you do or what, where is this going to go or what's going to happen with it? So I really just want to acknowledge the toll that these experiences have on all of us. Um, we're all navigating our own personal connections, our relationships, our cultural um, awareness and connection with all kinds of different groups and people all over the world. And it is in addition to the things that we're dealing with on an individual level with our families, with our siblings and with our children. And um, it's heavy. So, um, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to get into the details on anything geopolitical today, but I am going to talk about the human response, the human toll um, and families and what what people go through. 
Uh, the third event that just actually happened yesterday was another really large earthquake in Afghanistan, um, which has killed lots of people and adds another layer of challenge to supporting communities that um, are having a hard time coming through uh, resources. Um, in addition to those three things that have happened recently, um, Marianne actually brought up in the Q&A the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, I have... I've been to Southern Poland and worked a lot with Ukrainian refugees, which is something that will come up today. Um, our team is likely to go back to Ukraine, uh, not to Ukraine specific, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe Ukraine, but but probably Poland um, in the next several months to do more training for teachers specifically, because one of the things that's happening there is as school is getting back in, in areas around Ukraine, obviously teachers are seeing lots of traumatized kids. So um, that's another Another layer, right? That that adults in caring um, help situations um, are being taxed and stretched in ways that maybe we have never before. And so, part of what I'm going to emphasize today, in the con, um, sort of the, under the construct of doing this work, is how absolutely essential it is for each of us, regardless of what your professional technical role might be. If you are a caregiver of any kind, as a parent or as a friend or as a professional, and that's part of your job role, it is essential in the context of these disasters and these critical incidents to figure out ways to have boundaries for yourself and to take care of yourself in the process of helping others. Um, we have to do that in order to sustain our ability to navigate these, these events. Um, so I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to dive into some of the content, but I just want to acknowledge the global context of what are, what are some of the things, just a few of the things that are happening right now. Um, in general today, we're going to tackle some data around what disasters look like internationally and what's happening. Um, I'm going to share with you a framework for understanding phases of recovery and response, which it is just a framework. It doesn't apply, um, specifically to every single disaster, but I've seen enough of enough of these uh, things unfold to, to think that the framework makes good logical sense in a lot of ways. So I'm going to share that with you, as well as some common symptoms and experiences and some things that are unique around the world in terms of cultural response that I've learned the hard way in many ways, many cases, um, and some effective interventions, and then what we can do to re build resilience at a larger scale. So that's the plan for today. Um, just a very brief summary from where I'm coming from so that you understand sort of my perspective in doing this work. Um, I lived in Morocco for a year uh, with my husband, and I did research there. I wrote my dissertation while we were living there um, on coping and how faith can help people cope through difficulties and also substance use, which is a tricky piece of disaster response and recovery all over the world, even in places where substance use is not allowed um, or whether it's uh, sort of socially not acceptable. Um, I've made eight trips to Haiti um, right after the earthquake and focused on doing a lot of training, which I'll explain later. I made four trips to Jordan. I worked a lot with Palestinian refugees, with Syrian refugees, with some Iraqi refugees. Um, and we did lots of training with all of those groups, um, with leaders from within those communities, as well as with Jordanian relief workers. I worked in um, Jamaica for briefly. I didn't even get to spend any time on the beach. That's okay. I was there to work. Um, but the, Jamaica has one of the highest violent crime rates in the Western Hemisphere. So it was there to do some community support around violent crime. And then um, I had a couple kids. <laughs> That's what the gap is. And then went to Poland last year and worked with Ukrainian refugees and Polish first responders and a lot of teacher, teachers. Um, I have a meeting in a couple hours here to talk about Libya, and I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, and we are, our team is also working on some um, additional training and support for um, Gaza and Israel as well. So we'll see what's happening soon. Um, okay, in terms of the data, what is going on with these disasters? So um, you, this might not be surprising, and I think it's helpful to understand that the, the statistics and the research support what we probably are all thinking around like, geez, are these things happening more often, more frequently? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, unequivocally. So the number of um, disasters has increased by a factor of five over 50 years. So there is there are climate related issues here that are driving some of that in terms of temperature and in extreme weather. Also improved reporting because we have all this technology. We can know instantly what's happening in other places of the world. And so we're tracking things differently and a little bit more accurately. But, um, and this is the good news, but it, it's part of what makes it challenging also is that you know, people are surviving these disasters, which is wonderful. But 
um, the psychological toll when communities go through large scale disasters is really, really significant. And so we have lots, we have more disasters and we have more people surviving, which is again, a very good thing. But now as a function of that, we have a lot of, of psychological and behavioral health concerns that we need to really address. And we need to um, find a way to incorporate behavioral health in our perception and in our emergency response to things. It, it, it might not surprise any of you to learn that um, very, very rarely um, is behavioral health included in emergency management planning. So when states, individual states or state agencies or nations have plans for how to respond to crisis and disaster, um, very rarely do they include behavioral health as part of it. Behavioral health tends to fall under healthcare in general, which is not an emergency response function. So even in COVID, um, Washington state was actually one of the only states to have a specific behavioral health component to that response. Um, and it's just not something that has been adopted as regularly as we would like. So we're all paying attention because behavioral health issues are becoming um, stronger. They're becoming more consistent across the globe and symptoms are obvious and concerning, and it's disruptive to all of how we're functioning and how we're feeling. There's certainly a lot of pressure and a lot of a lot of tension. So mental health has been much more on the forefront of people's minds. Um, the global prevalence has gone up. And then on a global level, in terms of resilience, uh, one out of four people among the general population and health professionals has experienced low resilience. That's measured and defined differently in different places, but it means that that folks are struggling with their day-to-day -day in terms of baseline functioning. Um, this is just some information for you about um, disasters in general. These are the, this is the human cost of disasters. The 10 deadliest disasters are identified in blue. Um, and then mega disasters are considered the tsunami that happened in the Indian Ocean in 2004 and the earthquake that happened in Haiti because they were so significantly more catastrophic um, than the ones that have occurred in other places or on a smaller scale in terms of loss of human life. I want to be clear that that's what I mean. Um, so this is just sort of a map that indicates what we were seeing and what has happened um, in the last 20 years or so in terms of deadliest disasters and mega disasters. In terms of the total number of people affected, drought and flood are the most common all over the world. Um, flood, is, flood is still the most common. Um, I suspect that we will see an increase in flood related issues as things go forward because weather events are becoming more extreme just kind of in general and more frequent. So flood and drought are the most concerning um, in terms of number of people around the world that are affected and then various types of storms. And then the other category here is 3% and that's broken out into volcanoes and temperature, um, wildfire and landslide, et cetera. So, okay. You will have the, the slides available for you, for sure. And and all the references that these slide, these graphs are in are included on the reference sheet at the at the last, um, on the last slide. So you can access all of them and check it all out. Um, again, these are the 10 deadliest disasters um, in the history that we've been sort of paying attention. Um, the tsunami in the Indian Ocean affected Indonesia, um, India, uh, Sri Lanka, certainly, and then the earthquake in Haiti. Um, Myanmar, China, Pakistan, Europe, um, uh, Russia, Iran, India, and Somalia. So lots of, lots of things happening there. I'm just letting you, letting you look at it for a moment. Okay. Um, in terms of the number of total disasters that has happened worldwide, this is a really interesting thing. Um, I'm not sure who did this. I don't know who is responsible like as an individual or if it was a government agency of some kind, but um, at least from a, a, a United States lens on this, which is really important to clarify, for an event to be characterized as a natural disaster, at least one of the following criteria must be met. Uh, an economic loss of $50 million, insured loss of 25 million, at least 10 fatalities, 50 injured or 2000 homes or structures, da structures damaged. So by that, Criteria, just with that definition, we're seeing a, a steady increase. I'm not sure why 2014 is highlighted there. I should change that. But you're seeing a general slope increase across the years from the last 20 years. So a little bit of a consistent uptick in the frequency of these types of disasters. 
Um, and this is what I was mentioning in terms of the annual number of deaths from disasters. So they're going down. So as disaster types and uh, frequencies increase, the number of deaths are going down, which is a wonderful thing. Um, it, it just highlights for me the, the importance of including behavioral health to allow people not just to survive a disaster, but to reconnect with their community, to thrive, to recover from grief, um, to process loss, um, and for a community to sort of you know, get its feet underneath it again and, and figure out how to move forward. Um, it's a necessity. Um, it's not it's not an option the way I see it. Um, this is one of the first group of trainers that I worked with in Haiti. And the reason why I picked this picture is because I wanted to really emphasize that um, the human toll in disasters is by far more significant than any data chart, any map that I can show you, any statistics that I can that, that I can share. Um, the human experience is way more and way more important than what's represented that way. Um, Haiti lost almost 250,000 people and their total population was around 10 million. That is a huge number of people. Everybody, everybody lost someone in that country. These folks that you're seeing on this slide right here are a group of young men. They were all young college students and they wanted to become trained in behavioral health support to help their community. They were keen to learn how to provide appropriate interventions that people would respond to that could alleviate some symptoms. These guys came after having been trained by us for two or three different, on two or three different occasions. They came back about three months after our first trip and they became our first group of trainers so that they could deliver the training themselves. I'll explain more about what the training looks like later on. These guys showed up on World Cup final Sunday and they spent eight hours with us to do this training. And to me, number one, we were naive enough not to realize that it was World Cup final Sunday when we, <laughs> we set it all up. But the fact that they did that and the fact that they were willing to spend their day when everybody else pretty much anywhere that could get a TV was watching this game crowded around. They were missing out on that because they were wanting to learn what they could do to, to continue and advance the training that would help their community, that would help their people and their families. Um, and that's just that's always stood out to me as something that was incredibly representative of the capacity that we have to support one another, which is pretty, pretty fantastic. These are some special guys. Um, one of the things that we are all at risk for that happens all over the world, too, is something called a disaster cascade. So it is defined really as more than one large scale disaster impact that occurs during the window of recovery from the original impact. So the thinking is this. If you go through a disaster of any kind, typically a human will recover psychologically and in terms of behavioral health in about 18 to 24 months. It takes us a year and a half to two years. And recover, what I mean by recover, I want to be clear on this, is recovery to baseline. So however well you were functioning and doing before the disaster struck, it takes about a year and a half to two years to get back to baseline, right? That is if you don't have other things that happen, right? If you don't have other big disasters or, or individual crises or, um, you know, events that occur that sort of set you back. Disaster cascades is when that same thing happens, but on a community level or on a much larger scale. So in Haiti, what happened in 20, 2010 was that they had the earthquake in January. They had a cholera epidemic in April and in May that same year that killed about 3,000, 4,000 people. They had uh, a hurricane that hit in September of 2010. So every four months, once a quarter, there was something big. And then in November of that year, they had widespread election related violence. And so each subsequent event was another disaster impact for the community at large. That's a pretty clear cut example of a disaster cascade. But as we were just discussing at the beginning, all of us right now, based on the things we can see and are exposed to through media and through our, our connections, right? We are exposed to multiple different types of disasters and crises on a regular basis right now. So it, it really um, emphasizes for me the importance of being very intentional about how we engage, right? How we, how we choose to support people, how we choose to lend our either our financial resources or our time or our energy or our, our mental and emotional energy to something or to, to people who need support. It's so important to do that. And in fact, it's it's healthy with limits and with boundaries. And those boundaries are very different for each person, but we all need to have them. So thinking about what that looks like for you and within your community and when you need to pause uh, for yourself is really, really important. 
Um, it, with regard to the pandemic, uh, the you know global by definition, uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic was a global um, global influence. And I just wanted to share two pieces of information. One is the increase in prevalence rate for major depressive disorder. So remembering that prevalence rate is the rate or number of people who suffer with a given thing at a given time, right? The number of people in a population. Um, and the the closer to red, right, you're seeing high high numbers of increases in major depressive disorder when you adjust for what happened during the pandemic. So the blue purple color is the lowest rates and the high the red red color, red and orange are the highest rates down there. Um, so on a global scale, what we saw was an increase in in depression, which which really does make sense given the nature of what the pandemic did. Um, the way that communities were disrupted and the degree of isolation that many, many people experienced. The next thing that I want to show here is the prevalence and change of anxiety disorders when you consider what happened in the pandemic on a global scale. So um, similar types of things, similar look to what happened. This is depression. This is anxiety. Um, we saw increases in both. Uh, in, in some cases, very high increases. Anything that's over 25% is a significant Right, that's a significant population level increase for sure. And that's definitely what we were looking at in the United States. Okay, um, what you're looking at here is the difference, the global prevalence rate of depressive disorder, which is on the top, the two A columns, and then anxiety, um, anxiety generalized anxiety disorder, which is on the bottom, right? Um, comparing before the pandemic, like where were we before and where, where are we or where were we after? And you can see that it is significantly increased for females and for males. Um, and the pandemic didn't it didn't leave us untouched, right? We we can't just skate skate by now. It's 2023. You know, the, the big lockdowns were really in 2020. Um, just because those things are behind us in terms of time doesn't mean that the behavioral health consequences of that and the experiences didn't take a toll. So um, yeah, keeping in mind that that where we typically are sitting, but where we were sitting with rates of anxiety and depression before the pandemic was right around um, maybe 10%, five to 10% somewhere. And now those numbers are closer to 25% across, across the population. What I'm gonna share with you next, and I'm gonna use some examples from some of my work around the world. Um, what I'm gonna share with you next is the phases of disaster based on this SAMHSA framework. Um, this framework doesn't work for everybody. I don't want to offer it as like the way it is, rather um, an option for how to conceptualize what people go through when we have a large scale disaster. So um, this is uh, sort of representative of the behavioral health ups and downs. Uh, you come in at your baseline, which is the way that you're functioning before the impact takes place with your coping skills and your resources, right? You have the impact phase, you move into the heroic phase. The honeymoon phase is typically when people feel the most optimistic. It is when flags are flying and we've got this, right? In, in the pandemic, it was when lots of sign, signage, healthcare workers are heroes, lots of, um, you know, lots of spirit and lots of sort of community engagement around, we got this, we're going to be okay, we're going to make it through together. And uh, the honeymoon phase, unfortunately, it doesn't last super long. I'll give you some more examples of all of these things in just a minute. But we transition from the honeymoon phase then into disillusionment, which is really when you start to see the most behavioral health symptoms show up, depression, anxiety, cognitive symptoms. And I'll share those as well. And then reconstruction um, is the final phase. And that's usually literal, right? It's rebuilding roads, houses. Um, in the case of the pandemic, it's more social and political, certainly. But um it's just one way to sort of think about what we've been through. And I want you to consider what this looks like in the context of a disaster cascade. It's kind of like if you think of it like a little sinus rhythm or a heartbeat, but what happens when it gets faster and faster and faster and faster and it gets squished together and you have these events happening more and more. What what ends up happening in terms of behavioral health is that your, your resources dwindle, you get tired, right? And the entire, um, fr the, the entire um, behavioral health sort of uh, set of resources is is uh, lessened based on the frequency and the number of these high impact events. So that's part of what disaster fatigue is. It's just when we we just can't, <laughs> we just can't think about it anymore. It feels like there's a cloud all the time. We just get overwhelmed and we kind of shut down. Um, that's, it's really like, I just can't bring myself 
Um, it's compassion fatigue on a huge scale, um, sometimes even on a global scale. So something to consider, right, for your consideration. Um, time frame wise. So the impact phase is about zero to 48 hours. It really depends on the nature of the disaster. Earthquakes um, can have a much larger impact phase because of aftershocks and because um, ongoing rescue efforts, right? So zero to zero to 48 hours is that impact when something is happening. Uh, the rescue phase um, can sometimes last for not just a week, but weeks. So that is when um, you're really focused on safety and communication, like what's happening right now. Can we get people triaged? Can we get people safe? Um, in the context of gun violence as a disaster, the impact phase is you know immediate. And then the rescue phase is usually quite a bit shorter because those incidents tend to be over more quickly. However, um, you might skip through some of the honeymoon phase and, and move right forward into disillusionment pretty quickly. Uh, so it, like I said, it's a framework. Um, it doesn't fit everything exactly. And there's a lot of adjustment that we can do as well. The honeymoon phase is um, when the optimism is the highest. Like I, like I mentioned, there's a lot of support that's usually, to be frank, um, it's usually when the international community is throwing money at a given thing right here, fundraising, and here are all the campaigns, here's the stuff to donate to, to give and support. The honeymoon phase is really when that is strongest. And then part of what contributes to the disillusionment phase is that those resources run out. Um, the money and the attention for on a global level to a, to a disaster or to an event is at, at its highest focusing point about a month, three weeks to a month in. And then the attention goes away as well as the resources, which are often financial, not always, but often. Um, so the disillusionment in part is, is triggered and influenced by the degree of resources that are either withdrawn or just there aren't enough anymore. And that can be food resources, that can be financial resources, that can be like construction and material resources. Um, and it can be emotional resources. Like, I can't believe we're still dealing with recovery from this thing because I thought we would be better by now. Um, yeah. And then reconstruction, of course, can be ongoing. So the timeframes are different depending on what you're experiencing. Relative to um, interventions and areas of focus when it comes to behavioral health, one of the most fascinating examples, I don't actually have a link that I can share with you. You'd have to Google it. But there is a, a vi there's an audio clip from what happened in a 7-Eleven um, inside the walk-in refrigerator at a 7-Eleven during a tornado in Joplin, M Missouri. And um, you hear during that audio clip, we use it in some of our training stuff as an example of all of the different kinds of reactions that human beings have when they're in an emergency or a crisis. You hear someone rationally explaining what's going on. You hear someone screaming. You hear someone crying. You hear people praying. You hear someone comforting someone else and offering support. You hear someone trying to problem solve, right? What are we going to do next? You hear all of the different pieces of our human response when we're in an emergency. They're all normal. It's all part of our collective experience. Um, and I would encourage you to go check that out and see if, if you're interested, um, seeing if you can find it. It's not for everybody, right? It may, might not be your cup of tea, but um, if you're interested in learning more about those initial shock reactions that we have as human beings, that would be a good example. Um, psychological first aid might be an intervention that many of you already know or have heard of. That is typically what you want to be using and focusing on during the impact phase. Psych PFA is great for the first day or two after an incident, and then um, it starts to lose its utility. So I'll explain more about that in a second, but it is valuable. It just needs to be used um, at the right time for sure, as all, as all good interventions are. The rescue phase, again, sometimes up to a week. Um, your areas of focus are on adjustment to what's going on. Like, do you need a place to stay? Do you have a shelter? Um, what are the resources that are still missing? What can you do? You're exhausted versus sort of hyped up on ad adrenaline. Um, and then just like, what has happened? What, what has happened with this event? Um, is my family okay? Is it not? Like, what do I need to do? Psychological interventions are really around present focus, getting people to orient into their current needs so that you can um, you can assure them that they're not currently under threat. That's one of the biggest issues psychologically is, is trying to modulate that limbic response so that you can focus on um, what are the, the resources that are needed rather than the additional threats that might be happening. Just really focusing attention in the right way. Um, you don't want to ever 
force people to participate in debriefing. Um, SISM and debriefing has been very popular for a number of years. I'm happy to share, I have a slide deck with this, but a different set of resources around um, that it's not always helpful um, and it can be damaging. It can cause additional uh, psychological challenge for people when they're forced to participate in things like that. So it is a resource and um, it can be done, but it is not something that my team and I um, we don't we don't do it. We do informal um, and optional only um, processing and debriefing when we're doing response work based on the research that's been done. Um, and then you do communication and just sort of talking through stuff, but you're not doing trauma therapy. You're not going to start a, re a therapeutic relationship with someone um, during in, in the context of disaster behavioral health. The next phase here is the honeymoon phase. Uh, this is actually the phase that was happening when my team and I were working in Poland, in Southern Poland. Uh, there were flags everywhere, Polish flags, Ukrainian flags, um, lights. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of optimism, a lot of, a lot of discussion around being home by Christmas, um, which is not unusual. Um, and another degree of heartbreak when it comes to the long-term uh, sort of reconciliation with what is happening and how how tragic it is. Um, so the honeymoon phase is, you know, from an intervention perspective, really when you want to be offering offering training, offering resources, because people are interested. They have the emotional energy to learn about like what, what they can do to help. Um, it's when you want to try and establish some behavioral health supports and like a process within a community for how you can get people who are acute into the right level of care for how you can establish an increase sort of in baseline resilience within a community that you're working in and really gently, gently and carefully reprioritizing the focus away from just waiting until things get back to normal. There's a lot of this idea of we just have to hold out a little bit and then it'll be normal again. I heard that in the Zatari refugee camp in Northern Jordan, working with Syrian refugees. Um, I heard it um, in Amman working with Palestinian refugees. I heard it in Poland, working with Ukrainian refugees. This idea that if we just hold out a little bit more, um, we're going to get back to normal. And we need to try and um, help people, um, help people, I'm trying to figure out how to say this in the right way, because it's not about acceptance. It's about, um, it's about ha happiness. It's about life. And it's about help, helping people find a way to connect with a life that is meaningful that they are part of right now, rather than just waiting and, and holding back and not participating in the life that they're experiencing, even if it is absolutely not what they wanted or what they expected things to be. And so having hope in regard for that and, and figuring out a way to um, uh, sort of help them navigate their own acceptance of the reality of the situation, not like liking acceptance, but just like, okay, this is not what I want. However, this is the reality that I'm faced with right now. It's That's tricky. Um, I see a question that I'll just include here. How might you respond when folks say things will get back to normal soon? One of the things I um, do with that is sort of ask additional questions. It's like, what what is one of the ways that you could experience a sense of normality right now? Like, what are the, what does that mean, right? Normal, right? Is that your schedule? Is that the meals that you're eating? Is that education uh, for your kids? Like, what, what are the ways that that looks? And then how can we actually do that now rather than waiting <laughs> for the right set of circumstances to show up? So learning more about what it is that they mean by that and then helping them identify a way under their current circumstances, whether that's in a refugee camp or in another country, right, to... Um, increase that sense of normal for them in, under those different physical or environmental conditions. The disillusionment phase, um, there is nothing, there's nothing easy about this. It usually happens around six to nine months. And again, that's because a combination of financial resources, emotional resources, and attention tend to wane around that time frame. And uh, that this is when we really have to be on much higher alert for symptoms, suicide and depression specifically. Um, suicide rates tend to significantly increase during the disillusionment phase anywhere in the world. And I know uh, that there are many places where suicide is forbidden. Um, working 
in Jordan, um, you know, suicide is haram, which is forbidden. And yet people still commit suicide. Um, in Catholicism, suicide is also forbidden. And yet people still commit suicide. And it is a sensitive topic everywhere you go. Um, but it needs to be addressed. We, we cannot ethically, I don't think, just ignore this as being an issue, um, regardless of where you are in the world. So it needs to be handled carefully, but you do need to include it. Um, I really was shocked to learn too, that when you're working internationally, you have to be aware of, of what this actually looks like for people and what are the risk factors. Um, in the United States, as it's probably clear to all of you, um, access to firearms is one of the biggest risk factors when it comes to suicide during the disillusionment phase. But people don't have guns in other countries. And so there are different risk factors when it comes to self-harm and when it comes to suicide. So I know that this is a sensitive topic, um, but you just kind of have to ask questions and learn from the community that you're working in or, or supporting about what their individual risk factors are. Um, and it can it can be blindsiding sometimes, <laughs> but to be really aware that six to nine months in is when those risks are highest. So in, interventions are on um, sensory coping, um, active coping skills, like being intentional about activity choices, harm reduction in general, finding ways to have fun and still engage, but be safe. There's a lot of recklessness that happens during disillusionment. It happened in the United States too. Reckless driving started to increase significantly. Substance use tends to increase significantly. Um, so you really want to embed some suicide intervention and training and support. There are lots of research articles. Again, some things I can share with the MHTTC team about how bringing up the idea of suicide does not increase risk. And every, every single time, unequivocally, every single time I've worked internationally, one of the questions that someone asks is, but if I bring it up, isn't that going to put the idea in their head or increase risk? And the answer is no, that we have data on that. We have research on that, that supports this idea that gently and kindly asking someone if you that you are concerned about decreases risk because it tends to connect them with support that they, that they might need. So um, yeah, uh, being willing to bring it up. Um, and getting help from, your, you know, whether you're working with translators or whoever your local hosts may be, learning how to talk about it, asking questions about how to bring this up in the most gentle and appropriate way that you can, even when the topic is kind of off limits itself, because it's, it's, an, it's an important piece of disaster recovery. We need to not ignore it. Um, the reconstruction and recovery phase is sort of the final ongoing piece, and that can last, it can last for years, it can be short term, it really varies depending on the type of disaster. And you want to be breaking down resilience into its components of purpose and connection and adaptability and hope, really increasing these, these pieces, um, getting people to make meaning out of what they've been through together. And um, this is where the opportunity for post-traumatic growth might start to occur but not pushing people in that direction, just sort of, um, you know, helping them identify what makes sense for them with regard to them. Okay. So factors that can influence um, the, the way that we recover from these large scale disasters are, um, there are some things that are sort of universally common. And then there are some other things that are very culturally specific, right? So we can experience disaster cascades. They happen all over the world, but, Per, um, populations who experience, in general, social marginalization in any country, right, discrimination or racism, that have lower economic status and therefore lower access to resources. I'm thinking about people who are displaced um, anywhere, really, access to health care, um, access to behavioral health support, people who have been through adverse childhood experiences that have an, a neurological impact on recovery, um, previous disasters. Now, this is an interesting one because if you've been through a moderately challenging critical incident, it builds your resilience. If you have been through a horrific traumatizing critical incident, it tends to be a little bit of a risk factor, not a little, kind of a lot. So um, moderate level experience with, with adversity and, and, and emergencies is not a bad thing. Um, what tends to be harmful is when we have some... Um, some pretty horrific uh, traumatic events that occur, and that can 
that can negatively affect our ability to sort of uh, recover and practice that resilience building and that post-traumatic growth. It's it's tough, but it's possible. Um, the socio-political climate. So, what are the additional factors that are relative to that place and time? Um, and then for the for the pandemic spe specifically, it's additional variants. Like, are we done here? What's happening with this? Like, is it is is it actually done or is it not? Um, it, so the additional waves of things are really challenging for people too, but that's pandemic specific. Okay, um, just a few words on symptoms and common experiences. So all trauma is stressful, but all stress isn't necessarily traumatic. All trauma is stressful, but all stress isn't necessarily traumatic. So we all have stress as part of our human condition. Not everybody has trauma. Um, it is very likely in a large scale cat catastrophe event that most people will have been exposed to a traumatic experience, but it does not mean that most people are going to develop PTSD. It does not mean that. Um, and that is all over the world. PTSD as a diagnostic label and a set of symptoms is not um, the most common outcome by far. Um, typically what ends up happening is that within the first month uh, up until you get through that honeymoon phase, uh, the first month or so, um, maybe six months, nine months into the disillusionment phase, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of depression symptoms. There's trouble sleeping. There's headaches, stomach aches. There are really some common things that don't reach diagnostic threshold. And one of the things that is really important if you're considering doing international disaster work is to not take the DSM with you. <laughs> Leave it behind. It doesn't matter, <laughs> and at least not right then. Um, and it's not relevant in most places in the world, right? What matters is, is what someone is going through causing them a problem with the way that they would like to be functioning? Um, is it causing, is it causing pain? Is it causing an issue for them? And then working with those symptoms to try and reduce them rather than worrying about anything that's really Western, Western lens, American diagnostic system stuff. That's not um, that is absolutely not what the priority is under those circumstances. So the way that our brains are impacted um, is based on what we've been through in the disaster and how close we are to the epicenter of the situation. So I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, a young man in Haiti that I worked with who was a student. He was late for class and it saved his life. He was in the doorway of his school building and the entire, everything started to shake. So he kind of grabbed the door and he saw the entire roof come down on top of his class. He was the only survivor in his, in his class. So the whole building kind of pancaked right in front of him um, and squished, squished all of his friends. And it doesn't get more acute in terms of impact than that. He lost all of his social group. He lost his school, his home actually also under a different circumstance. I mean, earthquake also, but he wasn't physically there. Um, if you are in the middle of this epicenter, if you are if you are losing a direct family member, if you are losing your home, your work, you are directly impacted. That is the highest risk for future psychological and behavioral health issues. Those are those are folks based on what we know in terms of prediction science, right? Which is limited but it is exposure to certain things that predict psychological outcome. It's not actually how you handle it in the moment. So the example that I was providing earlier about what happened in the walk-in refrigerator in Joplin, um, all those different reactions, we used to think that the reaction someone had in a crisis actually could predict future response. And that's not true anymore. The, the subsequent research has shown that it's not how you respond in the moment so much as it is what you've actually been through. Um, and when you think about how children respond, you know, you can have a kid flipping over a desk and acting out and angrily and there, you know, in some ways that's easy to spot. Like this kid is distressed, right? But the kid who just sits there with their head down and doesn't participate and doesn't raise their hand and kind of isolates that kid, you know, they could be bored, but they could also be pretty seriously traumatized. And so it's not about the expression. It's about what they've been exposed to um, and doing a little bit of little bit of detective work uh, to find out what that is. So the closer you are to the center of this, the higher the risk, basically. Um, in addition to in addition to exposure um, and the sort of centrality of that, we have a set of common experiences with large scale crisis. We have our cognitive challenges, 
because when our cortisol levels go up, we get um, some some fogginess, we get trouble making connections, we have trouble remembering things. Our cognitive functioning tends to decline when our stress levels spike. And stress levels tend to spike after a large scale disaster. So cognitive challenges, physically, um, craving carbohydrates, not eating, eating too much, really having trouble with sleep regulation, um, not being able to fall asleep or falling asleep, no problem. And then waking up in the middle of the night because your brain engaged and you're not rested. Uh, Lots of physical stuff. Behaviorally, we have acting out, aggression, reckless driving, substance use, um, just taking risks. Um, For teenagers, especially, we have risky sexual behavior, drug use, things that are that are out of character, right? For adults as well. Um, We tend to look for ways to regulate our our neurology by getting some dopamine, by getting some serotonin. um, And we tend to not think very clearly or logically about making sure we do that in a healthy way, right? It's just like, I want to feel better right now. And people, you know, take some pretty big risks when they're, when they're on that page. Um, Shutting down, isolating, um, a lot of anger that's expressed, uh, emotional roller coasters, social relationships that are, that are torn up or um, sort of threatened because, you know, you have had very different experiences and nobody really gets it. Um, a young woman that I worked with in Haiti, um, she, you know, she, she, she saw several of her friends die, but she, she stopped making friends. Like she wouldn't socialize because she didn't want to get close to anybody to risk losing them again. Right. Um, in terms of spiritual components too, uh, I, you know, typically what happens is that people either have a stronger relationship with God or a higher power, or they have a more fractured and distant relationship with God or a higher power. One young woman in Jordan that I have to bring, I have to mention this. She, um, we got to the section in our training about suicide risk again, and she got very upset with us. You can't talk about this. You can't bring this up here. This is not appropriate. Uh, She got very angry, Um, but she ended up staying And we did not expect her to come back the next day, but she did. And when we got done that day, she took us aside, me and another trainer. And she said, "Um, I'm sorry I got so upset. I know that this is important to talk about, but um, the the reason that I reacted so strongly is because when my brother was killed in the war, I had thought of hurting myself too. And I I feel very guilty for that because it's, it's forbidden. And I don't know what to do with that. I didn't realize that it was a common thing that people thought about or that, you know, it's, it's, there's so much distress that that's sort of something that people think about sometimes. Um, and she was feeling a lot of guilt and a lot of shame around it, but was able to sort of process it through a little bit. Um, and trying to reconcile her spiritual beliefs with that intense emotional experience that she had with the loss of her brother was a big challenge. So understanding how common these things are and that she is not alone Um, no one is alone in this. We all go through these things. We've all seen pieces of this in the pandemic for sure. Um, One of my favorites is a a lady at the grocery store. I have so many weird grocery store stories for some reason, but this woman walked into the grocery store, looked around. I was getting a cart. She looked around. She's like, I just cannot make these kinds of decisions today and just left. (laughs) And it's like, we've all just been there. We just, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I have to figure myself out and have a little bit of a little bit of a meltdown or a little bit of a moment. It's super common. So validation for that is important. Grocery stores are a microcosm of society, aren't they though? I've got so many. I had another example of a woman who, speaking of the limbic system, um, this was in 2021 when we were having some pretty significant supply chain issues here and there was nothing in the dairy case. Like there was maybe a couple gallons of milk, but like nothing, it was no yogurt, no, whatever it was missed. It was empty. And so I was standing there like, huh, what are, what, what are my options? And this woman stood next to me and she looked around and then she just went off. She just, she was yelling about Washington, but I couldn't tell if it was DC or Washington state. Like, you know, all of this is going wrong. And she just sort of unloaded and there was nobody else back there, but me. And I'm just standing there like, okay. And then she turns and looks at me and she goes, thanks. Sorry. And then just left. <laughs> so she just had to, had to get it out. Um, that was a limbic system response to no nothing on the grocery store shelves. Our limbic system is designed to protect us and to keep us safe, to make sure we stay alive. 
And it's great. It, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. However, the limbic system causes a problem when it starts to influence our behavior, behavior when we are not in the context of a crisis. So the limbic system needs to be regulated and we need to learn in our, in our bigger picture of recovery, how to control our limbic system responses. Um, it's hard to do that, but it starts with recognizing when you, when we all have like these limbic system moments um, and we react aggressively, emotionally, very impulsively, your limbic system is what tells you to send an email that's maybe inappropriate or a text message. And you're just so mad and you just want to fire it off. That's your limbic system. And your prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that's like, no, 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 no. Delete, 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 then send, right? So when you're talking about disaster stuff and you're talking about our international as human beings experience, excuse me, experience of large scale disasters, this limbic system prefrontal cortex uh, interaction is one of those universal things. And when we're doing our training in other, other places in the world, I have found that this is one of the pieces that people really are interested in. They're like, oh, I didn't know that about like how the brain works. And that explains like some of the behavior that I'm seeing with my coworkers or um, with my teenage kids or whatever the case may be. Having a little bit of understanding of the neuroscience about what happens to the brain when we feel threatened is incredibly validating for people, regardless of what their education level is or language that they're speaking. It doesn't matter because that's part of our universal human, what we have in common. What is different everywhere in the world is then what you do with it and what you do about it. So interventions are culturally relative, right? You're, there are certain things that you maybe do want to suggest in parts of the world and do not want to suggest in others. Um, the interventions are going to look different, but the baseline information about like, this is what happens in the brain. And these are the normal symptoms that is very reassuring to people. Um, and then you can also ask, right? Get a lot of feedback about, have you seen this? What does this look like in your community? so that you can see some of the manifestations um, that are local that people might be experiencing too. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm confronting with in um, a lot of my work is people who say, well, we're constantly under threat here. Like our limbic systems are constantly uh, like keyed up, constantly activated, um, what happens neurologically under those circumstances? Um, my most recent trip was actually just this last May to Alaska. Um, and I went with a team um, that was, it's, it's related to MHTTC at UW, but we went with a team to Nome and we were talking to school district, you know, teachers, person, uh, the principal, superintendents, coaches. And one of them raised their hand and they said, all of our kids are traumatized. All of our kids have this limbic system activation. They're traumatized. Um, it's constant because of the environmental conditions, some of the social conditions, the lack of resources. There's just a lot of things happening to activate people's limbic system on a regular basis. What do we do then? The, you know, what I can tell you when you're living in an environmental place, well, it doesn't matter again where that is, anywhere in the world or anywhere in the United States. One of the most powerful things we can teach and learn in terms of behavioral health and psychology is the, the modulation skills, the power to modulate um, and being aware of when a threat is actually threatening. Is there a bear coming out of the woods or am I just, is my body reacting like that's the case, but that's not the case. That is a learned skill that teenagers and adolescents absolutely can learn. Their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed yet. That doesn't happen right until you're in your early twenties, but it is absolutely a skill that's possible to learn. So the power of modulation is that, that moment of like sort of insight, do I, am I under threat or am I not under threat? Like taking that moment to sort of evaluate and then respond appropriately. That's the, that's the teaching piece. And that is hard. It's hard to do. It's simple, right? But that doesn't mean it's easy. So it's simple, but it is, it is hard to do. It's about modulating threat response versus not and going back and forth rather than just letting your brain and your body stay in that limbic threat mode to have the insight about, okay, now I am not under threat. I'm going to relax a little bit, but as soon as I need to protect myself again, I can go back into that and vice versa. Um, it is a, it is a situation where, especially for kids, they have to have some environment, whether that's at school or at home or sports or something, some environment where they are able to not be threatened, where they have the, the environmental conditions so that they actually can and do feel safe. 
if no environment exists where someone feels safe, it's almost impossible to reduce that limbic system response on a regular basis. So it really is about creating a circumstance or a, or a physical situation under which people have the ability to, to feel safe and then learn how to modulate from there. Okay, I'm going to talk about best practices in disaster response, and then um, and then we'll have some time for questions. I just want to know where I am here. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm getting lost. Okay, all right. So disaster behavioral health is not clinical psychology. That might be obvious, but I'll explain what's going on there. Clinical psychology, which I also practice, right, is typically where you are in control of your physical conditions, your office space. Most of the clinicians that I know take very good care of, you know, the artwork on the wall and the seating, like they're strategic about how they want to place their environmental um, situation so that it is the right atmosphere, the right vibe for the client. Uh, it's very, uh, it's very controlled, right? That is absolutely not the case in a disaster situation. Um, in clinical psychology, in the United States, at least, we also have HIPAA, which is healthcare privacy and paperwork that we fill out and notes that we take. It's a 55 minute hour. Typically, um, there is a therapeutic relationship that is established when you're working with someone. You see them multiple times, you develop that relationship. Um, multiple meetings, and then you have a treatment plan. You know, like, what is the big picture here that we're working towards over time? None of those things are the case in disaster zones. You have very challenging environmental conditions personally for you. So you might be hot, you might be sweaty, you might be really tired because you're sleeping in a tent. Um, there's all kinds of situations that can happen. You might be doing your work in a very open setting with very little privacy. You're not doing therapy, right? You're offering people some symptom relief, you're trying to, um, but you are not operating in the physical environmental conditions of a therapeutic relationship. Um, multiple occasions, I've been working at a field clinic um, where um, you have to sit like literally back to back with another provider and you're talking to a patient in the clinic and they're talking to someone and that's just the space that you're working in. So you can kind of hear part of their conversation and I'm sure they can hear part of yours. Um, and that's, that's a little bit about just the way it goes. Um, you just, you really have to do your best. I have done the, this type of work on an overturned bucket, sitting in the dirt on a rock. It doesn't matter. You work where you need to work. There is no record. Sometimes there's almost no record keeping. Um, the physical conditions make a huge difference there, whether it's a humid environment and paper doesn't do well, right? Or now with electronics, like maybe it's not as hard to um, it, it's different than it was in 2010, even in 13 years, we have so much more technology in terms of like taking an iPad and, and taking some records, but you have to be as careful as you can to still protect privacy to the extent that it's possible. Um, you are training people in skills and in symptom reduction because you really want to try and actually avoid developing a therapeutic relationship because you're not going to stay there unless you are living permanently and you're going to move and permanently be in that community and see them as a client later. Um, that you're not doing a therapeutic relationship. One of my best examples for what not to do was on, I think it was our second or third trip to Haiti. There was a, um, a, a, another, a provider from another country, I'm not going to say where, and she was used to clinical practice and she um, put out a piece of paper on a door in one of the classrooms at the school where we were staying and expected people to sign up for hour long therapy sessions in the building, when people were terrified to go in buildings after what had just happened, there's rubble all around. Now the school that we were hosted at had stayed up, totally fine, it had been checked, but the community was terrified to go inside buildings. But nonetheless, she decided she was gonna have private therapy space with a sign up for one hour at a time and, and start to develop these relationships. That is so unethical because she was gonna get on a plane in a week she was having people relive some of their traumatic experiences, trying to do sort of PTSD work and then taking off and leaving again. That is, um, it's harmful because it can reopen experiences and reopen wounds. And she's not there to help them deal with that because she's gone. So it's a really, um, it's not okay, <laughs> basically. And one of the biggest issues about doing this type of work professionally is that you have to be willing to sort of let go of traditional traditional modes of practice in order to be appropriate and ethical and effective in the community that you're working in. It, it makes me a little mad. 
Um, yeah. So this is, um, I just wrote this because for me, this is one of my big learning curves for me personally. One inevitability of international work is that you are going to mess up, to do or say the wrong thing, to do or say something offensive without meaning to. What matters most is how you handle it, the way you approach it, and the way you repair it, the process you use, and the humility that you bring. I have done so many wrong things without meaning to. I try really hard to do a lot of homework ahead of time to learn about culture, to learn about history. Gosh, the history of a place is so important. What is the historical relationship that this, the people in this country or in this part of the country have with their neighbors and with their community and with their government? Like, what does that even look like? It's different everywhere. And we are so naive to most of that. So really doing a lot of learning and you're still going to mess up. You're still going to say the wrong thing. One of the, you know, there's some, some big issues. There are gender dynamics that are huge. There are social distancing dynamics in terms of hugging, high-fiving, how close you are to people, right? There, that's different everywhere in the world. Eye contact even too, uh, how loudly people speak. Um, there's just a lot of opportunity for mistakes, I guess. And so it's naive to think that you're never going to make any. Um, what matters more is that you do your best to try to not make them, not just come in and like, I'm just going to do it this way. And you all have to adjust. No, you're in their, you're in their space. You are in their uh, community, right? So you need to learn from them about that. And let, you know, help be, be very observant, like be tuned into the dynamics that you're seeing. This is an example of one thing that I totally did wrong, trying to do well. Um, we were in the home of a Syrian refugee family. This was a two bedroom home that was, there were about, about 23 people that were living in this home. And it was, a, it was three brothers and their wives and kids. And we were visiting them because one of the kids was really sick and they were really having a hard time. Anyway, we were doing some support with them directly. And when one of the brothers came home, we had a female translator with us who was younger than me significantly. I think she was only like 16, doing a great job. She was studying English in school. So she's a great translator and she volunteered to help us, et cetera. And she, she, she was in that community. So she knew this family. So when the brother came in, um, she was very sort of quiet. She didn't stand up. Um, there's a there's a lot of dynamics there that are complicated, but I was taking my cues from her because I was the only other female in the room. Um, they were all men and he came in and she did not stand up. Um, and she was sort of, um, sort of submissive to him. Like she acknowledged him, but just like, you know, gently. And so I did, I copied her because I thought that that's what was appropriate. That was not appropriate. <laughs> I should have stood up. I should have offered to shake his hand because I was a professional, like a doctor visiting from another country. And it was considered so rude of me to stay seated. But I was doing what she did because I thought that was the more appropriate thing. I completely screwed that up. Um, and I, and it was, it got weird. And so I asked her later, I was like, what was going on? She goes, oh, you, you were so rude. You should have stood up. I'm like, I did not know that. Anyway, um, live and learn. <laughs> I apologized. And the rest of the the rest of the day, it went okay, uh, but that is not a mistake that I made again. So one of the things is to you know learn from your mistakes, try to avoid making the same one twice, and apologize where you need to, um, and approach it with humility. You just don't know. You don't know what you don't know, and there's going to be mistakes made. Okay. Um, in response and activation and deployment, be willing to do anything that needs doing within your skill set and competence. I've worked with so many teams where like maybe I'll, I'll, there'll be an ophthalmologist and he has to um, sort medication and he's mad because he's sorting medication. Or there was a medical student who wanted to do wound care and um, he ended up putting fitting people for glasses. And he was like, I came here to do wound care. And I was like, but people need glasses. Like you just do what you need to do as long as it's within your skill set and competence. There was a woman giving birth on one of our trips in the classroom um, and it was getting dark. Um, I do not know anything about gynecological support in terms of surgery or delivery. That is not my area of expertise, but I held the headlamp <laughs> like I could stand there and do that. Um, but I'm not getting involved with things that are beyond my competence level, right? There's a wonderful article um, by a psychologist who went to 9-11 um, and it's called, I don't remember what the name of it, it's called, but it's about washing the boots of the first responders. 
And he went there to do disaster behavioral health and he ended up washing boots for a week because that's what needed doing. And in the context of doing that, he heard stories and he shared with people and was able to support them in this very non-confrontational, safe way just by being the boot washer and being in that role. So it's always okay to step up and do something that needs doing. You got to let go of traditional ways of providing service. It just, you do what you have to do in the, in the time and with the resources that you have available. Um, it has to be scalable somehow. You learn as much as you can about the history and culture of a place, including norms, as you can. Um, you just need to be as educated as you possibly can to not put the burden on people who are surviving a disaster to educate you, right? I mean, you're still going to make mistakes and ask for clarification, but the, the responsibility is not on the survivors of an incident to educate a foreign person on their culture. It, that is your responsibility. And then be willing to connect with your colleagues, be willing to share your challenges, um, be willing to sort of process what you're going through as you're going through, or it's a really, it takes its toll significantly. Um, I'm a huge animal person. And my first, my first deployment to Haiti, <clears throat> we, you know, I'd been working for many days, 12 hour days. It was super hot. We were totally exhausted. And I saw a puppy get run over. And it was hor horrible, um, very distressing and upsetting for me. And I just sort of lost it. But it wasn't only about that. I mean, I would have I would have broken down anyway, but it wasn't only about that. It was about all of the things that I had heard and seen and how bad it was and how much distress people were under. Um, and it all kind of just and I just needed that for a moment. And my colleagues were there to support me. They you know, they were like, just take a minute, do what you need. Um, and. They, were, they checked in with me, you know, I just kind of, I kind of lost it for a second. And then I was able to get myself together again and, and keep going, but you got to recognize your own limits and being able to reach out and ask for emotional support from your colleagues. And then also be willing to be friends and connect with the survivors, right? Just to know them a little bit as people, um, even if you're going to go your separate ways in the long run. The continuum option, uh, continuum of care options looks like this. So PFA, like I mentioned, very scalable. Within the first 48 hours, everybody can have PFA. SciStart is called, is a particular type of triage where you're screening, <clears throat> you're, you're doing a triage for um, exposure to things. Um, HST is something that my colleague and I developed that I'm going to talk briefly about. And then there's additional screening and more in-depth in treatment and then emergency care if needed. You know, lots of these options are just flat out not available in many places in the world. So you work with what you can, which is often a community-based group of people who want to help that aren't professionally trained. <laughs> so this is our first trip. This was our team on the soccer pitch at the school. That's the school in the background that did not collapse. Um, we joined a multidisciplinary team. We call ourselves the Doctors Without Borders Rejects. <laughs> Um, or, you know, that was the unofficial name of the trip of the team. Um, we were hosted at a, a suburb. Um, that's the other thing you need to be hosted. Um, I have a, I have a colleague actually who was on this trip <clears throat> who engages in what I call, um, a little bit of disaster tourism. Uh, he will often go to a place without having an invitation or a host and not what, not know what they're going to do, just show up and try to help. Um, that is, not okay, in my opinion, because it taxes the the very um, few resources of a population. So it's really only appropriate to go when you have a host or a host organization who will um, is asking for help and for support, uh, rather than just going and sort of imposing and saying, "I'm here to help. I'm here to show up." And by the way, I need somewhere to stay, and can you feed me? Like that's not um, that's not appropriate at all. Even if you can pay for it, if those resources aren't there, you're taking them away from someone in the community who might need them. So you just kind of, you just kind of, you know, need to stay aware of the circumstances. Um, the HST training that we do, health support team, is meant to be those guys that I showed you at the beginning, the trainers. This is a community level training that anybody can learn that's 13 or older, right? You start with active listening, listening and learning, supportive communication. And then you help them identify internal and external resources, maybe refer if needed. You provide a tool, which is a, it, it's a symptom reliever. It's a, a little bit of CBT or a biofeedback technique, um, like progressive muscle relaxation. There's a, a handful of 
very accessible. Anybody can learn them interventions that have been nicely vetted all over and supported with data in terms of their effectiveness um, and then emphasizing hope. So those are the pieces of HST. Um, it is meant to be people from within the affected community who, who just want to help and don't know how to do it. So it's a training program for community volunteers or for professionals who don't necessarily have a background in behavioral health. So students, coaches, teachers, parents, we have a education specific version of this. And we also have a, a guide a training for anybody who wants to support kids. So we have an adult a basic guide, an adult trainer guide, and then a kid, youth, teen guide and a trainer guide of both. So they're train the trainer and basic trainings for kids as well as adults. And it's anybody in the community who wants to do it. Typically it's students and people who are in leadership positions who are already helping, but want to know how to engage with some of these skills. And my favorite piece about HST is that it is, it's expected that when you teach this, that the people you're training um, adapt it to the local cultural circumstances. Right. So they adapt the way that they do active listening, not to do it like we do it, maybe, but the way that makes sense and the conditions that make sense in the community that you're part of, which is, of course, going to have different nuances about eye contact and, and uh, physical distance and all of that kind of thing, as well as examples that people use storytelling and things that are different in different places. So it's meant to be embedded within the community. You're meant to we, we are meant to train trainers who can then deliver the training in their community um, it's organic um, and it's it's culturally adapted. That's the biggest thing. It's not, it, it is us saying here is, here are things that we know based on Western research and data are applicable internationally. They're applicable to everyone. They've been used all over the world. However, um, it's a menu of things. Now your job is to take this information and apply it in a way that makes sense to your family, to your community, um, in a way that's useful. And you're welcome to adjust stuff. So that's what it is. You can, you do the training. This is us not doing the training inside, but outside because buildings again. Um, yeah. This is how it looks. These are some of our first volunteers, not the trainers, but the volunteers. Some of these guys became trainers eventually. And these are the, these are the trainers. <laughs> and then what ended up happening, which was really cool because there is almost zero um, psychological infrastructure, professional infrastructure in Haiti. Um, there were at, at the time of the earthquake that we were there, there were only, there was one MD psychiatrist and four PhD level psychologists in the whole country. And so it really uh, emphasizes this point of building from the, the bottom up. Um, our trainers became involved at a local clinic. They would just on their, you know, they would have a couple hours, they would go down and talk to people in the waiting room the doctor that this the guy in the front with the tie on, he was the, the manager, one of the doctors that ran that clinic. And they gave him a little space where he could talk to people and kind of do some therapeutic stuff. Um, he didn't charge for it. That's one of the deals is that you just do this as a volunteer. You don't get to hang out a shingle. Um, but he, he wanted to help his community, which is why he got trained. That was just one example. So we trained a lot of people in Haiti, a um, lot of a lot of folks. And then we took it to Jordan and we worked with Palestinian and Syrian refugees in the Zatari camp and with CARE and NG and uh, Save the Children. So this was a combination of Syrian and Jordanian folks. And then we went back and we worked with Palestinian refugees as well. Um, and we trained women to do a women's training. So we trained a group of women to be trainers for other women. And it, it was the first time we've segregated by gender in that way. Um, but it's very relevant uh, to to make make this kind of support accessible. Uh, we were we were told um, this would be helpful for us to have a women's only group, and we thought, sure, let's do it. If that's what's useful, let's let's do it that way. So it was, um, and then we went back and did a multidisciplinary training in Amman, um, more NGO staff uh, across disciplines. So we did education, content, and mental health, et cetera. Um, I want to share this story briefly with you, uh, and then we will, um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up and take questions. I'm just going to show you one more slide after this. Um, actually, sorry, there's a couple more. I'll be brief. Um, how are you, my friend? I actually have a good experience I would like to share with you. During my work as a field assistant, this is in the Zachary camp in Northern Jordan. Um, 
child-friendly space, I've noticed that Batul, a pretty girl, 13 years old, had something wrong. She had some aggressive behaviors. And when I had have tried to know about her by listening to her carefully, I asked her with, with some other girls to make a relaxation session in a quiet place. So he was teaching mindfulness and breathing. Um, after the session, I asked the girls to go each individual in order to express about her imagination by words or drawing a picture. Batul, she had drawn a grave with a fountain beside it with a shade of someone, a shadow, right, or, or a, a ghost. Um, and when I asked about her about the person in the grave, she refused to tell me. Um, and I have told her that you have to write his name on the grave. She wrote her dad's name, but at the same time, her dad still alive. But she had fears that someday she would lose her dad. And she told me that she sees that in her sleeping. Then I realized, and this is what we teach people, there's no need to refer right? I could handle this by the mindfulness technique. I made a, a session daily so that I could change to change all the bad thoughts and make her focus on the present moment that her dad was still alive. And after the last session, I asked her to draw and she had something different. I have pictures before mindfulness and after practice, same girl, pretty cool. Um, so this is what we, this is what we train. Um, I think this is exciting. Okay, um, we went to Poland and we worked with Caritas, which is a, um, a, a large NGO uh, relief organization in that part of the world. And we were hosted by a colleague at the University of Economics and Innovation, uh, who is a psychologist. Uh, he asked for us to come and do some training. We worked with Ukrainian children and mothers um, in Firle uh, and you know, worked with a lot of other folks. Uh, we trained school principals, superintendents, and we trained all of the Lublin 911 operators. So everybody who answers 911 in southern Poland and Lublin um, now has a little bit of behavioral health training where they can offer um, symptom reduction techniques and things. This this uh, uh, The back of this van was parked outside of one of the relief centers, and it has a Ukrainian license plate on it. And we were laughing. We were like, oh, it says like, wash me, like it's universal. And our translator was like, that doesn't say wash me. That says Putin is a expletive. And I was like, oh, that's funny. So we took a picture of it because we thought it was funny. <laughs> just had to share that with you. Okay. I'm going to just sum up for you now. Um, there are a few additional slides that we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, but this is kind of the summary that I wanted to end on anyway, uh, to wrap it up. I wasn't sure how how much time I would have with this. So here we are. Don't self-deploy. Um, be prepared at home by getting your kit together. I have a backpack in the trunk of my car that has tennis shoes, a first aid kit, a, a get home bag so that if there's an earthquake in our area, um, I know everyone on this webinar is in different places, but learn about like what the risks are locally and be prepared to be able to walk yourself home. Um, I like fancy shoes, but I'm not walking home from Seattle in fancy shoes. So tennis shoes, uh, make a family communication plan. Um, turn off iMessaging on your phone in a disaster because it takes way more bandwidth if you have an iPhone. Have somebody in a different area code that you can leave messages with or change the voicemail on your phone to have a message that says where you are or where you will be. Um, include your workplace um, in your planning. Have, you know, everybody has EHR, right? All these electronic records. But what do you do? How do you access clients? How do you get a hold of people if the system goes down? So having a paper record that you keep in a locked file cabinet, right, that's available so that you can have a have a plan um, and educate yourself about local resources. So community emergency response teams, FEMA training, if that's interesting to you, there's lots of things that are free and available online. Um, I'm going to skip this. Sorry. This is the bottom line, right? Um, if you plan to travel um, internationally or work internationally, learn as much as you can before you go. Learn more about PFA, HST, if that's something that's interesting to you. Educate yourself on disaster behavioral health best practices, kind of the things that we were talking about today. Um, do some inventory around your personal level of comfort with ambiguity and things changing all the time because they do. Like that is one inevitability of international disaster response is that stuff changes all the time. You have a plan and then the plan goes out the window. So you got to roll with it. And if that is not your cup of tea, this is not the work for you, right? It just, it, everybody's different with liking that or not liking that or being comfortable with that or not. So yeah, um, if you're interested in doing it, uh, just get as much training as you can and get certified in things like CPR. You could join a medical response um, 
group or a community emergency response team. So you have a badge. They have them all over the country in the United States. And then your your background check and your badge so that when there is a thing, you are already um, vetted to go ahead and respond. Like then they'll let you behind the tape and you can, you know, you can help because you've been through the training and you've gotten that process taken care of. Um, so yeah, these are just some of the, some of the takeaways. The slides that I skipped are just about general um, intervention best practices with active coping skills and active listening, symptom relief, um, which are fairly universal, but you just have to be aware of what the resources are. So the only, the only thing I'm going to say is, um, last thing is that it's really important to be aware that when you recommend an intervention, you are mindful of the resources that are available. When I'm working in the United States, one of the things that we teach to parents is to do blow bubbles, to have bubble wands and bubbles with their kids to practice deep breathing, slow control of breath. In a refugee camp, it is not appropriate to suggest bubble breathing because soap is so important and valuable. You're not going to waste soap on bubbles, <laughs> right? So that's not a good recommendation to make. Um in a scarce resource environment, you just have to be aware of what the resources are that are available so that you're not recommending something that's really either not appropriate or not accessible. When we were working in Poland, one of the recommendations for intervention that I almost always make is ice, right? Um, holding ice to uh, deal with anxiety. Uh, our translator, who is Ukrainian, said that no one's going to do that because ice and snow are dangerous and historically and culturally seen as a negative or deadly thing, which I, I understand, but it didn't, didn't occur to me that when I make the suggestion of putting your hands in ice water or holding an ice cube to, to stop a panic attack, that that's not a suggestion that's going to be well received, right? So you, you don't know what you don't know, but it's okay to ask and to, to be humble in your questioning. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. The references are included for your use. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but we have a minute or two. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Sorry. Well, thank you. There's there's one question that just popped up. What was the organization called that led the training oh, for school staff? It was, the, it was the school district. It was one of the school districts in Lublin. I don't know the name of the district itself, but it was through the superintendent of the school district. Um, yeah. I could probably figure that out or find that information for you yeah. for sure. Um, well, just thank you again, Kira, this, I, I just, I'm blown away every time. Um, and for those that had not had a chance to hear you speak before, I don't know how you make these really difficult topics, um, seem digestible and manageable and maybe I wouldn't say hopeful, but you know, you, I, I just, I don't know where all of your energy comes from and I know it's not endless and your optimism, but gosh, um, I put in the chat. Um, if anyone wants to see any of our archived webinars, there are several that we've done with Kira over the past few years and they're all excellent. I'm very biased, but I do, uh, believe in, everything you've ever shared in our training events. And so thank you again for, for bringing, you know, this just, I think, I think what's so unique and I could be wrong about this, but your varied experience and where you work is you're, you're kind of around the entire whole thing of the human experience, you know, that you are in, you know, world disaster response. You are locally helping communities and people who are suffering from tragic events. You, you know, are a parent, you have a counseling practice and a psychological practice, and you have this instruction at the university. So I know a lot of people um, have the pleasure of getting to work with you. And I feel very grateful to um, know you and have oh, you yeah. share what you, what you do. So thank you so much. Thanks. I, that is very kind of you to say, I love, um, I love this work and I, I really want to emphasize if I'm guessing there's, it's not a coincidence that everybody came today because this is, this topic is just in our faces. Right. But I, the reason why I do it and why I love it is because no matter how horrible things are, there's always hope always the, like what people are capable of is horrible, but also the kindness and the, and the, like, uh, the, the, the capacity of humans to help each other and support each other is also is endless really. And so that's, 
why I do it and why I love it. Thank you very much for taking the time, everybody. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Be well. I mean, I think, um, as I said, either here on the podcast, I personally get a lot of out of all of these events. And so I'm selfishly very um, grateful for hearing the content. You helped us get through a lot of stuff. You continue to do so. And um, thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And uh, we'll see you next time. I know the team will stay on. Thank you to uh, Gabriel, um, making sure everything's working. And uh, welcome to Amy, to our new training manager. And um, they'll make sure if you have any other questions um, as we head out. But thank you, everybody, and take care. See you next time.